I live in Romania, second largest Eastern Orthodox country. The idolatry and heresy is incredibly repulsive. Yeah, for those of you that don't know, the Eastern Orthodoxy, very similar, yet very different from Roman Catholicism. They do pray to dead people. They pray for dead people. They teach that it's possible to be saved after death, even if you never repented in your life. Obviously, praying to Mary and the saints is an act of idolatry. And not only that, you know, when you go inside of an Orthodox church, there's all sorts of images and they bow down to these images. They will say, oh, we don't worship the images or anything like that, but it sure looks like they do. Anyways, I'm sorry to see Western teenagers converting to this cult, thinking it's somehow cool. Yeah, I was surprised to see that when I started making videos on TikTok, there's a whole lot of young people who have never went into scripture to actually study the Bible, but have converted to this false religion known as the Eastern Orthodox Church. It's like, I'll make a video talking about justification by faith, Romans chapter three, and how this obviously doesn't work with within Roman Catholicism. And then people are in the young people probably in the comments are like, what do you think about orthodoxy? It's like Rome and the Eastern church teach the same exact thing regarding justification. It's by your works plus faith and not faith alone as the Bible clearly teaches. But let's watch this video. If you were to die today, are you hundred percent sure that you'd go to heaven? No, I'm not because the orthodox understanding of salvation is that I was saved by Jesus Christ. I'm currently being saved by him and I will be saved in the future. So it's not a one-time thing. It's not a one-time decision by me because I change. I sin, but then I'm supposed to get up from my sin. It's the nature of demons to fall and never get up. It's the nature of angels to never fall. It's the nature of humans to fall and then to get up again. All right, I don't know what that last part about the nature of angels and demons and humans. I don't know what that was about. But it's pretty obvious that this man has never read and understood stood the book of Luke. Let's go to chapter 10. This is where Jesus sends the 70 out to preach the gospel, heal, heal the sick, cast out demons, that kind of stuff. And after they returned with joy, they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and all over the power of the enemy and nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. You see, the non-reformed people out there, the people who think that you can lose your salvation and it depends on your good works, can't actually rejoice that their names are recorded in heaven because they don't know. And the obvious reason for this is because they don't know Jesus Christ. They don't know the gospel. They're not saved. This is why Eastern Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, it is part of the mission field. These people are not Christians. Let's go to John chapter 5, verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me, let me highlight this right here, has, this is present tense, eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has, this is past tense, this has already happened to you if you believe in Jesus, passed out of death into life. Let me highlight that as well. So the reason why you should be able to rejoice right now if you believe in Jesus is because you have already passed out of death into life. So as long as I keep getting up, I can get to heaven, but behold, the bridegroom comes at midnight. If I keep getting back, Back up, then I can be saved. What's so sad is that in the comments of this video, there's people applauding his humility, but I see the opposite. This is pride. Jude tells us in his epistle, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. You see, the reformed Christian like myself says, Jesus is the one who keeps me up, keeps me from stumbling and makes me stand up. It's about him who keeps me, not about me who's just able to keep getting up because I'm so righteous. See, these Orthodox people, along with Roman Catholics, they're going to flip around and say, no, we can't save ourselves. But then they say, oh, if I keep doing this, if I keep enduring to the end, if I keep doing good works, then I'll be saved. They are inconsistent and they need their eyes to be open. We continue. don't know when Christ is coming. We always have to be prepared. We always have to be ready. If salvation was a one-time decision, then I'd be saved. I wouldn't have to do anything that it says in the gospel. But rather, faith is obedience to Jesus Christ. So I have to, like in Matthew 25, I have to feed the hungry. Faith is obedience. That's a huge error that you do not want to make. This man clearly has not studied the book of Romans, especially chapter three. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Do we abolish the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. Let's also go to Ephesians chapter two. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Faith 
isn't the same as works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Okay, so faith is a gift from God. It comes first. It's not of works. And the faith which a person now has produces the good works which God has prepared beforehand that that person should walk in them. Yes, saving faith produces good works, but saving faith is not obedience. That's That doesn't make any sense. Do like in Matthew 25, I have to feed the hungry and clothe the naked and all those things that he said. And if I'm not doing those things, I'm falling short. And will I be saved? The Lord says no at that time. He says, you will go to the left to where the goats are. So I have to constantly work towards my salvation. So I have to work towards my salvation. Those are the words of a self-righteous fool. Because he thinks that Jesus has shed blood on the cross, all that work he did in his life. Mm, you know, it's pretty good. You know, you did, you did do a pretty good job, Jesus. But me, I have to do this for me to be saved. I'm glad you did that, Jesus, but I got to play my part. <laughs> That's according to every non-reformed Christian. And Matthew 25 does say that when Jesus comes back, he's going to put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom which has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. To the extent you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. And obviously the goats did not do these things. And I love how Jesus calls the righteous the sheep and the unrighteous the goats. Because then we can pair this with John chapter chapter 10 where Jesus says that he is the good shepherd and he is the owner of the sheep and he calls them out by name and leads them out. He says, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I know my own and my own know me and I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. So Jesus says that there are people out there who are sheep. He's talking about the Gentiles in this context, but there's people who are his sheep but haven't yet been brought in they are lost sheep and need to be found and saved obviously but we saw in matthew 25 that the sheep are the people who obviously do these righteous deeds but notice verse 34 inherit the kingdom which has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world so there's this kingdom that the sheep are going to inherit which god planned for them to inherit there's this idea that after i come to faith and after i do enough good works then i become a sheep but there's people out there who are considered sheep sheep before they even hear his voice and come to faith in him and do good works. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they will never perish ever. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And this video is just so sad because this is someone who thinks he knows the way of the Lord, but he has no idea. Let's watch another one though real quick. I know a lot of Christian denominations, they say that justification is by faith alone. Romans chapter 3, just so you guys know, this is not a denomination. This isn't my interpretation. This is a, a real chapter in the Bible. It's called uh, Romans. You should study it sometime if you haven't. Paul lays out his arguments. You know, everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we maintain that man is justified by faith up Apart from works of the law. This isn't my denomination that says this. This is the word of God. Verse 24 even says that people are justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. You can't be justified as a gift and then say, oh, I have to work towards justification. That makes no sense. Well, let's continue. So, do you have the book of James? Do you read the book of James? So, James says in his universal epistle, faith without works is dead, right? Mm -hmm. So, how do we put that in? Again, True faith means obedience to God. True faith produces obedience to God. Not true faith is obedience. Don't make that error, guys. It's, it's very important not to do that. If we have faith in Jesus Christ, that means we do what he tells us. If we don't have faith in Jesus Christ, it's like our Lord said, not all who say, Lord, Lord, will be saved. God is good and merciful, but he also says, as I see, I judge, and my judgment is just. So not just say, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. That's it, I'm going to heaven. I have to show that. I have to show the action. There's a synergy. And again, another Greek word, synergia, work together with Jesus Christ. If I'm not working with him, then, then I'm not really having faith. And that's just, I'm paying lip service. I love how he brought up James chapter 2 and how he clearly misunderstood, like most non-reformed Christians do. Let's go to chapter 1 first. Uh, and in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. Why are we saved? Is it from his will? Or is it because we did good works? Or because we repented of our sins and came to faith in Jesus? No, it's all his will, his work for his glory. Now let's go to James chapter 2. What use is it, my 
brothers, if someone says he has faith, but has no works, can that faith save him? This is a natural faith. This is someone who does not have supernatural faith in God. Before I continue, I will have to go to Philippians chapter one, where it says, for to you, it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but to also suffer for his sake. So believing in Jesus isn't something that a human being can do on their own. It's something that must be granted to you. Like in Luke chapter 8, Jesus says, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is in parables that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Why do you understand the gospel and other people don't? It's because you've been granted the secrets of the kingdom and they have not been granted the secrets of the kingdom. So James compares this person who says he has faith to the person who has faith and shows it by their works. This is obviously the person who has been given faith, true, genuine, saving faith from God. Hebrews chapter 11 does say that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And obviously, if you have this natural faith that you came up with on your own, it's not going to please God. It's a selfish kind of faith. Oh, I believe in Jesus because I want eternal life and I'm just going to go on sinning because Jesus has it covered on the cross. Those types of people have natural faith. They're not saved. So uh, faith, if it has no works, is dead by itself. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar. Now, the Greek word used here is dikau. I'm not sure how you would pronounce that, but other places in the Bible, it is translated as vindicated or acknowledged. We already saw in the book of Romans that justification before God is by faith apart from works of the law. So if you think that James chapter 2 contradicts Romans chapter 3, it means that you don't hold to sola scriptura and you don't think that the Bible is the word of God. The only solution here is that James is not using the word justification here in the same way that Paul was. Paul was using it in the sense that, okay, someone is declared righteous before God. And James was using it in the sense to show to be righteous. So when you read it this way, was not Abraham our father showed to be righteous by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? This is what makes the book of James make sense. If you think that James is talking about justification before God and that you're saved by faith plus works. It means that you think James is going against Paul's teaching in Romans. But of course, on the flip side, there's some hyper grace, uh, free grace theologians out there who think that Paul is teaching against James. And they obviously lean towards Paul, like faith alone, you don't have to do any good works. You can keep on living in sin. Those types of people, those people obviously don't know what they're talking about. But the reformed Christian, we take both, we accept both. And we love both James chapter two and Romans chapter three and Ephesians chapter two. You see that faith was working with his works this is synergism faith is working with his works and as a result of works faith was perfected the way he was talking about a synergy was uh, he works with jesus for salvation the bible nowhere teaches anything like that anyways uh yeah do not fall into the orthodox cult and instead always remember genesis chapter 15 where it says that abraham believed in the lord uh, yahweh and he counted it to him as righteousness this is before he got circumcised or offered up Isaac on the altar. Abram believed in God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Then he performed the good works which God prepared for him to do. The moment you start teaching, Abraham believed God and then performed a bunch of good works and then God credited it to him as righteousness. You're preaching a false gospel and of course, Galatians 1, even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to the gospel we have proclaimed to you, let him be accursed. What is the gospel, guys? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 1 through 4. This is the good news. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures he was buried and was raised on the third day and you are saved by this gospel if you hold fast to the word aka the good news oh foolish galatians who bewitched you before whose eyes jesus christ was publicly portrayed as crucified the only thing i want to learn from you did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith are you so foolish having begun by the spirit are you now being perfected by the flesh did you suffer so many things for nothing if indeed it was for nothing so then does he who provide you with the spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So know that those who are of faith, those are the sons of Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law to do them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous shall live by 
faith. However, the law is not faith, rather. He who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith, not through works.